Hey guys, what's up? It is week 380. I have a handful of reviews for you, one little thing to show for an update, but let's hop right into this. The first one up is from Altered Innocence, a label that kind of, uh, they basically do a lot of LGBTQ kind of oriented films and whatnot. They released Knife Plus Heart and um, Equatus to the Unknown. Was that what it was? Equator? I can't remember the name of that one, but they're, they've released tons of good stuff. Starfish, which is a cool movie. So yeah, this one is The People's Joker. And the title alone kind of catches you off guard. You're like, what is this kind of strange parody kind of style thing? Uh, Right here it says, the best superhero movie I've ever seen, Richard Brody. And uh, yeah, this is definitely a bonkers, unauthorized parody of Batman. But uh, by kind of parroting Batman, you can say so much about society in general. So our lead character here... Um, they don't ever say their name for the beginning when they are. Um, it's it's directed by a trans actress, also stars a trans actress, uh, Vera Drew. So in the very beginning of the movie, like they blank out the name uh, because it, I guess is you know their dead name. Uh, I would assume is why they're doing the blanking out the name, uh, their identity in the beginning because we see kind of this character. Um, kind of tell their whole backstory and we see their childhood with their mother and it's kind of coming of age kind of style story and what they learn what they want to do by watching like television all these things they want to be a comedian but it's in this Tultarian society where Wayne Enterprises runs everything so now we have Batman as kind of a villain which is really fun here um, because he's just like you know he, he, obviously you could feel that turn that billionaire evil corporation running everything um, and you have to go to a comedy school and you either have to be a joker or or Harley Quinn, you know, and you have to follow these kind of things. Uh, basically, what happens is Vera Drew's character. Um, they don't. I don't think they actually genuinely name themselves until later. I think they go by the People's Joker or something like that. It's uh, what is their name? Uh, the Harley Quinn Joker. I think it goes by that. She goes by that eventually. But so what happens is she goes to this school and she's kind of confused about her sexuality at this point, and uh, you know meets this the the penguin character and at the school and everything and it's just not going to work out so she drops out and what happens is she, they start this underground anti-comedy club so it's not technically a comedy club so you can get away with it and it's riddled with all sorts of weird comedians including poison ivy and there's different types of animation this is definitely a big green screen movie a lot of weird kind of green screen effects um cgi effects animation and it jumps in all these different things um it's completely absurd it's an absurdist comedy it it says a lot of weird kind of parody moments, but you know, I think the humor mostly comes from just the absolute ridiculousness of the whole entire situation, how the characters react, how society is, you know, it, I want to compare it to kind of that weird kind of, you know, satirical RoboCop world. But if, if it was done in the eyes of something that's completely over the top and silly, you know, RoboCop is absurdist and, and upset here, satirical, but this one is also zany and goofy and just all over the place. Insane. Um, it is a cult movie through and through. There's a couple movies that come to mind for me. Like, just like if you see stuff like the Oregonian Oregonian, which is not as goofy as this, but, uh, I, I think I can't think of the character's name. He's the guy who actually, this is going to be such a long shot no one is going to even understand the references i'm making he was in toxic avenger 4 and he went ahead and made his own movie and it's just one of these movies where it's kind of just a character going on this long weird bizarre journey and running into all sorts of bizarre characters but this is really clever in the aspect of course um vera drew meets another trans person and she finally gets her full transformation a la the joker style falling in the vat so she comes out a woman at this point we have this relationship with her parents and it, this movie is very touching you know it, it, it gets the it get makes you laugh it makes you like the characters and it pulls on your heartstrings um very drew is really funny really great comic timing really bizarre kind of character um lo- loved her and she was really funny great stuff and the the person who plays the penguin is also quite hilarious um like it's the kind of movie where like you have the weird stuff on television like suicide cop where you're just constantly killing himself which is hilarious reminds me of bio cop from the end of um you know the astron six guys what was the movie i think man Bork had a uh, bio cop at the end of it crazy ass movie and it has these weird kind of zany nasty effects are uh, rough around the edges but they fit the world this movie takes place in and 
I definitely have to name that. Uh, geez, I can't think. Uh, Susan and Denise are actually in this. They have a Instagram and they have a YouTube channel. I think it's YouTube, but I know I see all their stuff on Instagram. It's YouTube as well. But Susan and Denise do these crazy. It's a, it's a three people that they do these hilarious ass videos where they dress up and do all these different characters and use all these cool animations. They're in here, which is really cool to see them pop up because I've watched them for years. So yeah, uh, this movie's a lot of fun. Uh, it, it's a directorial debut. It's super bizarre. It's super funny. It's got cult written all over it. And and it's so hard to say what a cult movie is because you'll never fucking know. And 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 I don't want to say this movie's aimed out to be a cult movie. I really just think it's the filmmakers' personalities bleeding through. And they're so bizarre and zany and goofy that I think it just makes for a, a wholly heartwarming, unique, funny story that I really liked. And um, I, I can't help but think of the Wesley Willis song, I whoop Batman's ass while watching this. But I like how they kind of make the weird characters, you know, like you have Two Face in there and Clayface and like Clayface is a woman, just like background characters and everything like that. Uh, it's 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 a lot of fun. And if you, I'm sure if you know more about Batman, I know my fair share of Batman stuff. I'm not uh, a complete Batman nut, but I, I got a lot of the jokes and everything like that. Just really enjoyed it. I would recommend this one. Uh, it makes a lot of uh, comments on society too, over medication, um, you know, the, the whole trans issues and stuff like that, feeling trapped in your body, not having supportive parents, all that kind of stuff here. Uh, evil, greedy corporations, it's all in here, and it's fun, and it's really good stuff. As far as the special features, we have a 24-page comic uh, zine, commentary track with director Vera Drew, commentary track with director Vera Drew and actor Nathan uh, Fosselin, uh, commentary track with assorted cast and crew, discussion with Director Vera Drew and Corpses, Fools and Monsters, Authors Willow, Caden McClay, and Caden Mark Gardner, uh, Queens, uh, Queensbow TV, behind the scenes featurettes, original theatrical trailer, the original trailers, and there is a there is something on here about the Suicide Cop that they talk about, which is very funny. So yeah, cool, fun movie from Alternate Innocence. I really had no idea what I was getting myself into, but I enjoyed it. Okay, the next one up is the Weekly Western. I'm not going to roll the big intro. I don't want to, you know, have this video be too long and have the Weekly Western pop in right here. But we got one from Fun City Films. And uh, this is a wild film. I had never really heard much about it. Uh, it is Bad Company, 1972, starring Barry Brown, who's an actor I'm not super familiar with. He died very young. And Jeff Bridges, of all people. Gotta love Jeff Bridges. Um, there's also uh, a slew of other classic kind of character actors in here. You got Ed Lauder. You got um, David Huddleston from The Big Lebowski, also with Jeff Bridges, which is very funny. The Lebowskis are both in this. I don't want to miss. I know I'm forgetting a couple of the character actors. Oh, Jeffrey Lewis is in here. He reminds me a lot. You know, Ed Larder and Jeffrey Lewis, I see them both pop. Also, we got the guy from um, 92 in the Shade who Warren Oates chases down and hooks him. He's also in Swinging Cheerleaders by Jack Hill. He's a character actor who's in a slew of these kind of 70s movies. So... When I see Ed Lorder and this kind of stuff with Jeffrey Lewis, I immediately, for Ed Lorder, I think like uh, Lolly Madonna, LLC, or, you know, Death Hunt, or those kind of gritty 70s movies. And I see Jeffrey Lewis, I think uh, Cold Pepper Cattle Company. That movie's an excellent film. And it also has the ragtag group of kind of outlaws joining up with the cattle company and that. So, like, this movie is a lot like that. If you like those kind of movies in that kind of vein, I think you'll dig this. But this follows a young man who's dodging out of the Civil War. He doesn't want to go fight for the North, so he kind of dips out and he tries to head south i believe it's the north he's escaping from so he heads south and uh he gets robbed by jeff bridges jeff bridges knocks him out and takes a, a lot of his money and everything like that so what happens is he tracks down jeff bridges and they have this long drawn out funny comedical fight kind of deal and he ends up joining up with jeff bridges he ends up with like four or five others i think four other kids two two brothers uh one of which is played by a very young john savage before the deer hunter yeah before the deer hunter very good in this as well and uh, they kind of are out there trying to scavenge money and do criminal activities and they do run into david huddleston who is a leader of a gang of outlaws and that's where they come in and that's jeffrey lewis and the guy from 92 in the shade and of course um she's uh at lorder so that that stuff's really great but it's just kind of surviving on the open prairie and all this kind of stuff and sometimes it's comical uh there's bonding between the characters but really it's the relationship between jeff bridges and barry brown uh yeah it, it's violent it's one of these movies where you're kind of 
plodding along and just realizing how boring and uh, typical, you know, boring and uneventful, you know, Western life is in this kind of area. And then boom, all of a sudden someone's brains are on the ground. Um, they're, they're, they don't pull back who they kill. There's a lot of dark imagery in this movie. Um, they call it an acid Western. There's like a lot of bizarre kind of whacked out Westerns in the 70s, which are some of the best, honestly. Um, what would you would you call El Topo the ultimate acid Western? Or would you just call that just a midnight fucking movie of insanity? I think I would call it an acid Western. But I, I, the definition of acid, acid Western, I'd have to really sit down and think about and just kind of, you know, you got the, you know, the revisionary and the classics and stuff like that. But then you start throwing weird ass terms like acid Western and just are completely out there weird westerns and this is definitely kind of one of them um it's definitely like self-aware of the uh, genre obviously and stuff and it plays with its characters and there's moments of like just kind of absurdity and, and comedy especially in one of the shootouts um but it's it's when you're watching it it doesn't seem all that funny but it is goofy but i don't think it's as unrealistic as people might think i mean in terms of stuff like that people do weird shit in in, in in that kind of situation and I can imagine that um, it's really well shot, it's really well acted, the music is good everything about this movie is really solid I really like this, I thought it was great stuff as far as the special features are concerned we only have an audio commentary by Walter Shaw by Walter Cha but uh, yeah, I, I, Jeff Bridges is he would be a safe bet to pick as the best actor I think, he's not my personal favorite but like all if you look back out of all Jeff Bridges' movies, from the last picture show to you know this to everything he's ever done, from Big Lebowski to the remake of True Grit, True Grit. Sorry, I'm still having trouble with um, the the oral surgery I had. It's still a lot of pain. Probably something went wrong, honestly. But uh, he's just an exceptional actor who's done a wide variety of work and done tons and tons of different films and always does a great job. And there's no different here. Um, and I really like the interactions that he has, Barry Brown and him do have, and the relationship they have amongst each other, you know. Um, there was times when I was getting mad at Jeff Bridges if I was Barry Brown, but then at one point he realizes something and that is kind of like the end all right there. But um, really well-made movie, well-shot movie about kind of a rich rich guy or a better off guy kind of running into some kids or younger people that have nothing and, and pairing up with them and just struggling to survive and the frontier bad company okay this next one is from severn films and this is from 1983 the glorious year of 1983 and this is like post-apocalyptic movie meets a little bit of kind of a western tinge but it definitely feels like mad max it's an italian post-apocalyptic movie and this is 2020 texas gladiators the 4k from severn now, this is directed by Joe D'Amato and George Eastman, who, uh, you know, worked with Joe D'Amato several times. He's anthropophagus, of course. But uh, Joe D'Amato is no stranger to the post-apocalyptic movie. He did one, I think, is it around the year, same year maybe, uh, Endgame, with Al Cliver and George Eastman and uh, a slew of other actors who pop up in these movies. That's a really fun film. So I was kind of excited to watch 2020 Texas Gladiators. And the cast is, is pretty solid as well. You have Al Cliver again. You have Peter Hooten from everybody's favorite Night Killer. And uh, I believe Peter Hooten is in Glorious Bastards, if I'm not mistaken. I think so. And he's also played Doctor Strange in the old 70s TV film. And then you have the Asian actor who pops up in, I think he's in Endgame, but he's also in uh, Fulci's New Gladiators. Uh, he's awesome in that. So is Al Cliver. There you go. You know what I mean? you got your, your small group of guys that you're going to use for all these movies. Also popping up here is Goretta Goretta and uh, Donald, uh, Donald O'Brien who is in a slew of these nasty movies and, and a lot of Joe Diamato stuff. He's in uh, Zombie Holocaust or Dr. Butcher, M.D. I can't, I can't resist it, right? But, uh, yeah, so 2020 Texas Gladiators, a great cast. Right in the beginning of the movie, we are introduced to these, like, rangers, like these Texas rangers, right? And there's, like, five of them. And they are breaking up this group of monsters, like goons. They're not actually monsters, but just villains that are raping and pillaging this church. So these, these, these nuns are being raped, and the, the priest is being, you know, crucified. So they're definitely pushing buttons. They're going as far as they can go. And um, this one poor nun, this this imagery is in the trailer and it's pretty iconic when she realizes that one of her uh, sisters is getting raped she just decides to grab a piece, big piece of glass and cut her own throat so it's just like almost like they're pushing the buttons they're like well we're gonna crucify a priest we're gonna have a nun get raped we're gonna have a nun kill herself inside the rubble uh, of what you was once a church you're like okay i get what you're doing here joey d pushing boundaries and buttons like he always did 
But uh, what happens after that is the Rangers have a falling out with one of their their people, and uh, Al Cliver saves the girl, saves this girl. They start a relationship, and now we kind of fast forward, and they're like in this small community, kind of like Mad Max, right? We have that small community. I don't remember if it's the first or second one. It's been years since I watched those, but I remember there's this like community or something, or even No Escape, right? You you built your community in the in this horrible fucking world, and there's bad guys everywhere. So Al Cliver's running in this community with all his fellow people, his wife and his kid, and these biker crazy bikers attack, and they're led by the ranger who had the falling out he's he's pissed he's uh, he's with the bad guys now and what enters is donald o'brien and he's kind of like this nazi guy who's re- named like blackheart or something like that and he's like the black one or some shit and he's shaved bald looking crazy looking more like john steiner than he does donald o'brien in this movie so he kind of just is nazi style and they have these like thermos shields it's ridiculous they slaughter the town they take it over what happens is, you know, the buddies, his buddies get the, uh, you know, the, the 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 news of it, including Peter Hooten and the Asian guy and another guy as well, about what happened. So they try to, they, they run into the girl at a bar. They try to win her over. They get put in some salt mines. It gets crazy and everything like that. They escape and then they uh, realize that they're going to need some backup. So, you know, I, I'm just going through the entire movie. But anyways, uh, what happens is they get some enlist the help of some Native Americans who are living in the, the you know, the woods of the area. But you guys got to remember, it's it's Italy. And even in the 80s, I remember Deep Blood uses it as well, the Joe Tiamato movie, where, like, we need a Native American that's just Italians with wigs on back, like, in the heyday of old Western movies. And, of course, they're going to have this giant battle at the very end. They do set up some goons here and there. Greta Greta is one of them. There's one lady who has her breast assist hanging out, and she's in, like, bondage gear. And there's one, like, big guy who performs some sort of sexual assault on a young man, which is very strange in the scene. It's very weird. Um, you're not really sure what happens, but you really don't want to find out either. Um, so, you know, it has that kind of weird element where it's like, we have half biker guys in leather bondage that look like rejects, it, rejects from the, you know, the road warrior. And then we also have half guys that are like Nazi style regalia with thermal shields. But guess what guys? Arrows go through the thermal shields. So fuck yeah but uh the movies is is a decent post-apocalyptic movie it's solid it looks really good on 4k i enjoyed it is it as good as endgame nah is it as good as uh new gladiators not nah. both from severn as well is it you know it, it's it's not my favorite post-apocalyptic movie but would i pop it in and watch it anytime yeah, I think I would. I enjoyed it. It's good stuff. And also, I like the cast. You know, Peter Hooten's pretty intense in this, you know. I, and I kind of feel bad for Peter Hooten because he's not a bad actor. I mean, his dubbing in here is not great. I mean, it's probably his own voice, but whatever. I'm not 100% sure. But a lot of the dubbing in here is not perfect. But Peter Hooten's a better actor than Night Killer. I mean, he's fine in Night Killer, but the performance is so over the top. The dialogue, the scene, every, the movie's just over the top. So, you know, when he's in there, he's like, fried chicken. You know, everybody's like cracking up and it's so bizarre and weird, you know. Uh, I got assaulted in a little boys room. So, like, I think everybody just immediately laughs when they see Peter Hooten after Night Killer got released. But, um, you know, he's solid in this and this is kind of a fun little silly post-apocalyptic movie with lots of non-consensual scenes in here. So, be warned, you know. It's the 80s and, you know, the 80s, especially these kind of movies, is, is a lot of rape. A lot of rape in here. But uh, as far as the special features are concerned, we have the UHD on its own disc, the 4K. And then we have the Blu-ray. We have Shoot Me, the Real Story of the Italian Texas Gladiators, archival interviews with Joe D'Amato, dr- uh, assistant director Michele Soave, screenwriter Lu- Luigi Montefiore, who is George Eastman, and actor Al Cliver. A Gladiator Goretta interview with actress Goretta, Goretta. And then we have the soundtrack. So, yeah, this is a fun, solid little uh, you know post-apocalyptic movie from Severin, which is insane that this fucker is on 4K. But enjoy. All right, guys, we're going to hop into those 1982 movies. things and you just attack me right now so some of you are still human this thing doesn't want to show itself it wants to hide inside an imitation 
It'll fight if it has to. But it's vulnerable out in the open. If it takes us over, then it has no more enemies. Nobody left to kill it. And then it's one. This son of a bitch, you moved the cemetery, but you left the bodies, didn't you? This son of a bitch, you left the bodies, and you only moved the headstones! You only moved the headstones! What's in the basket? Stop it, there's no more time. You've got to stop. Please stop it. Stop it now. Turn it off. Turn it off. Stop it. 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 First up is a movie that I have not watched in years by the same production company, I believe, or same producer as Scanners, if I'm not mistaken. So definitely a Canadian co-production here, and the cast would suggest as well. This is Visiting Hours, 1982, like I said, starring um, you know Michael fucking Ironside, Lee Grant, William Shatner, and Linda Pearl. Linda Pearl, I think, is the actress's name. So, you know, Ironside made a career out of being bad guys. After 1981 with Scanners, uh, I think that the trajectory of him playing a villain was forever kind of cast. And, and he's great in this. So what we have here is your, you know, it's kind of like Don't Answer the Phone, where we have some sort of maniac get obsessed with a, you know, a media personality and kind of stalk them. That also happens somewhat in the seduction. So we have that, the seduction, Don't Answer the Phone, all in 80s stuff. Seduction is actually this year as well. But... This one's a bit different because visiting hours mostly takes place in a hospital. You know, hospital horror. The year previous, we had a hospital massacre, of course, aka X-ray, and Halloween too. Um, so yeah, we have a little bit of ho um, um, kind of hospital stuff going on. The next movie has some hospital scenes as well. They we talk about, but uh, so one day Lee Grant is talking about a case, uh, a high caliber case where a woman killed her husband because she said he was abusing her, yada yada yada, and whatnot. She thinks that she got railroaded, wants her out. Michael Ironside is watching. He's he's he, obviously he's mentally ill. He, we're gonna see his past trauma and everything that stems back from his childhood. He's taking care of his decrepit father. All that kind of stuff's gonna play into his backstory. Um, pl there's plenty of time to do it. The movie's an hour, I think 45, so it's a little long. If I'm not mistaken, this movie runs a little long. Long. And it has a lot of thriller aspects, but I would say psychological thriller aspects, but it, it does turn into a horror film. The body count's not super high. Four, I think four or five people maybe die, including, you know, the, the ending. But 
So what happens is Ironside starts to target this woman, uh, William Sh and Lee Grant. William Shatner is her producer, kind of boyfriend kind of guy. Shatner plays it down in this. He's very subtle. It's a very good performance. I I'm a Shatner fan. Some people aren't. Um, but he he's not, Yo, you know, typical of when people do impressions of Shatner. That's not him in this. He's pretty good in this. Solid downplaying it. Um, Lee Grant is a little over the top in this performance. She's kind of funny, kind of silly, almost to where she's like, nah. It's like, I understand she's been through a lot, but it's kind of a little over the top. Ironside is bonkers he's scary he's intense um you know he takes care of his uh, father uh, but he also dresses in leather and picks up prostitutes and beats the shit out of them that plays into the plot later on but uh there's a really crazy scene where ironside does a home invasion and he attacks lee granite first and he injures her and that's where we kind of have her be stuck in the hospital ever since that and ironside sneaking in other ways and crazy different ways to get in the hospital and whatnot yeah it, it, it's kind of a slasher thriller more maybe a thriller first than a slasher but it does have the slasher elements I wouldn't say that the kills are super gratuitous, although some of them are kind of screwed up, you know what I mean? But it's not an overly gratuitous film. Obviously, Ironside's character suffers from a lot of sexual frustration, a lot of childhood trauma, a lot of, you know, misogyny. He hates women. Um, he can't stand them, obviously, from the flashback and everything like that. Um, but, you know, uh, I think it's a good film. I, th I think it's well made. I think it's well directed. I think it's a solid movie. I've never had any complaints about it. I've always felt the same way about Visiting Hours, you know, when it was on DVD from Anchor Bay. Now it's on Blu-ray from Shout Factory, Screen Factory from a while ago. It's a double feature of Bad Dreams from 86. Also a, a pretty solid movie as well. But uh, yeah, so so as far as the special features are concerned, we have interview with screenwriter Brian Taggart, a radio and TV spots. There's also some other interviews on here that they didn't list, but I would recommend watching uh, Visiting Hours for 82. It's good stuff. Next one up, I've covered this before on the show, and this is Silent Rage, 1982. Chuck Norris movie here, and this is probably one of the only two or three horror movies Chuck Norris ever did. He also did uh, Hellbound, and uh, what is it, Force Vengeance has a serial killer in it, but I don't really think it's a horror film from my understanding. I have seen Hellbound, but Silent Rage. Now, this is a rewatch for me, and I, I liked it just fine when I first saw it. Rewatching it, I think I like Silent Rage a little bit more. This one just kind of grows on me. I'm not the world's biggest Chuck Norris fan. I don't dislike Chuck Norris, but... You know, a lot of the Chuck Norris movies, you know, Chuck Norris isn't somebody's like, I'm the best actor ever, like a mm, Steven Seagal or some shit. You don't, um, I, I don't know if Skull ever says he's the best actor. He just walks around like he's fucking great or something. Um, Chuck Norris in this film is essentially a, a sheriff of a kind of a smaller town, from my understanding. Ron Silver is a doctor in here and he's performing some new kind of crazy, you know, medical experiment trying to develop this serum that will heal people quickly. Um, and also William Finley is one of those doctors. And there's another doctor in there too. who's kind of more of the evil doctor. Um, besides Chuck Norris, we also have Stephen Frust as his deputy. Um, Stephen Frust was in The Unseen from 1980. He also is in Animal House, you know, the other guy, the other, the heavy kind a young guy and later on he was trying to dream a uh, little dream with peter boyle and michael keaton and christopher lloyd um you know stephen frust is is pretty solid in some movies um i think he was even in one of those horror parodies from this year um but you know he kind of got shoehorned into trying to like they're like you do a belushi do a belushi you know what i mean it's just really unfair he, he doesn't really do that in this one he's just a very uh, kind of a dullard with chuck norris that's kind of fun so this is basically a slasher horror film hybrid martial arts kind of action thing um so essentially chuck norris in the very beginning he's just like seems like a down-to-earth really nice kind of sheriff kind of guy in the very beginning this guy completely snaps he's in this like hot summer house there's kids screaming everywhere he's like at a halfway house or something and he loses his shit he can't get through to his doctor and he ends up killing a couple people in the house and pretty kind of gory crazy detail i mean it's not like super gory but he the guy breaks a chair over him and he smashes him kills a couple people and the way that they're like trying to hide or fight for their lives is kind of disturbing chuck norris kind of gets there and, and breaks down the situation ron silver's his doctor he's trying to like i don't know how this happened and and what happens is this guy breaks the cuffs he gets shot they take him to this crazy hospital where they're doing kind of you know the experiments and also where ron silver works and they decide to pump him with this experimental drug that they haven't tested on people miraculously he starts to heal kind of in the vein of something like horrible aka absurd from 1981 where we have the eastman as that kind of uh you know healing kind of monster like wolverine or something so a lot of people always are like oh could we tie this into halloween uh you know what i mean michael myers and part too is kind of like this guy who's this is like big guy who never stops coming forward and you know he heals that would explain why michael myers is they're like hey people have always said shared universe that's kind of a fun idea 
So what happens is this guy, you know, realizes that Ron Silver wants to pull the plug. He never wanted to do it. William Finley's the other doctor from all the weird Brian De Palma and Toby Hooper films. And what happens is, you know, this guy starts to pick off the doctors. He starts to kill other people. Ron Silver's a good actor. Always a good actor. I remember him from Eat and Run, which is a ridiculous movie with Pat Ryan comedy parody thing about an alien who loves to eat Italians, not the food, the people. But, uh, yeah, silly movie. And he's good in that. He's always solid. Um, Chuck Norris is pretty cool in this. He's fun. Um, um, so the big showdown with him and the killer is cool stuff. Um, the killer is indestructible, so that's also cool. Um, there's plenty of squibs, but there's a great action sequence, of course, where Chuck Norris is in this bar and he beats the shit out of like 15 to 20 bikers. That's great stuff. It gives you what you want. Um, you know, Chuck Norris has got his one-liners. He's that guy that's like, he's not going to do shit until you absolutely make him. So he's kind of got that respectable quality about him. Overall, um, Silent Rage is a fun kind of slasher action hybrid, which is cool. I mean, Hellbound similar. It's also an action kind of horror hybrid. I, I prefer Silent Rage. I actually enjoy this one. I would watch Silent Rage again. The release here, it looks fine it looks decent it also comes with blind fury and white line fever two completely unrelated movies but uh yeah this this one earns its r rating i do think there is uh you know sex scenes maybe possibly some brief nudity as well but i enjoy silent rage good stuff yeah title's also awesome all right, we might have had some technical difficulties, so if I'm like looking at the screen wrong on Silent Rage or visiting hours, we'll have to deal with it. But the next one up is Back From Beyond, and this is a Spanish horror film. I'm not going to try to do the Spanish title. This is a relatively short film. It's 74 minutes. Now, this is also listed as kind of like an adult film, I believe, but I don't really see the adultness too much in this. Is you know, So essentially what we open up is, is like uh, a murder of four people in this house. And it kind of reminds me of I watched uh, one of the Taiwan horror films like that. Um, which was The Midnight, which wasn't a great film, but it had that brutal murder in the very beginning. And I was like, oh, it's very similar to that. But so we have this couple that's having sex on a bed and they're they're skewed like Bay of Blood, exactly like Bay of Blood in Friday the 13th Part 2. You know, the pull through both of them. And I was like, that's pretty wild that they're doing that scene. And then we have an older couple who are killed as well. The whole entire family is kind of butchered in this house. And we're like, oh, that was brutal. That was insane. We kind of fast forward to a couple moving into this house and we're like, all right, we're slowing down big time. And it's a 74 minutes. So it's a, a young woman woman and her husband and weird shit starts happening almost immediately they start seeing these dead people in the house as ghosts and are they warning them and as we kind of move along we realize that one of these people knows more than they're saying they're kind of dealing with some trauma and all that kind of stuff and we have a big reveal of why those people were murdered and all that kind of stuff like that overall this is a decent uh haunted house movie in the opening they get your hopes up because is this what what the hell is going to come out here what's going to happen but overall it's just our right movie i don't have that much to say about it the special effects in the beginning are cool but there's not much story here besides that there is story but it's just handled in a way that just kind of has the opening scene and then like a scene where you realize what's happening and you're like okay and then we have a little bit more of story but it's just kind of ghosts going in the nights and trying to figure out what happened um and i don't want to spoil exactly what happened but if you guys have ever seen what have you done to solange it's in that kind of vein but more of a ghost story of course and not as brutal murders or anything like that not really revenge killings just kind of just the ghost kind of walking around and uh whatnot it's called back from the grave it does have a blu-ray overseas but i don't think it's english friendly Okay, the next one is a Brazilian film called The Reincarnation of Sex. Great fucking title. Man, this is different. So I watched a lot of those Brazilian movies from last year, and they were basically kind of like, you know, like more sexual, um, like horror, more sex and stuff, and rape, revenge kind of things. And not necessarily horror, all of them, serial killer things. This one is straight up horror, and it's very sexy time in here. So in the very beginning of the film, we have this daughter who's from a rich family, the the mother, she lives with the mother and father, and she's sleeping with the help. They're in love with each other. And the father's actually played by a guy who pops up in a couple of the Coffin Joe movies as like a villain, as kind of like a mayor or something he's also in all the brazilian movies i covered from last year he gets killed in lily and the dirty he's one of the rapists in violence and flesh prisoner rapist um yeah this guy's just in everything he's, he's a good character actor from brazil so this guy's the father he doesn't like this he decides to take this helper out into the middle of the woods and kill him chop his head off in a brutal fashion and bury him um, the daughter and mother do figure this out. They go dig up the body. They plant the head inside the house in the in this kind of plant, potted plant. 
And what happens is we fast forward to a couple moving in there and almost immediately there's some sort of haunting this, this woman from the past, this girl, she's kind of back in the background, kind of like telling these people what to do and possessing these women and giving them ridiculous sexual appetites. So these women go out and they just want to fuck everything in sight. Their husbands several times a day. We get a lot of sex scenes and everything like that. And we know that this is kind of some haunted territory thing, but it gets crazier and crazier. And everybody who lives in this house ends up starting to commit murders. So, um, we, have a, we go through a couple different people living here and before long everybody wants to figure out what the fuck is happening in this house and we start to un unveil the mystery the old man from the beginning is still alive in a home and he obviously has had some severe damages and he's just not all there but uh, it gets a little bit more complicated on who owns the house, what the house is renting and all that kind of stuff there but it's just a bizarre weird crazy haunting with tons of sex there's a group, a scene where a group of people go to party there and it turns into like a would be orgy of biting and a little bit of violence and you're just like this is a wild ass movie but reincarnation of sex you know uh, it's a fun, crazy, weird ass movie, kind of a little disturbing, but I enjoyed this one. Uh, I would recommend it. Uh, wacky Brazilian horror film that is much better than you would expect. You know, uh, I, I, not that the other ones are bad. It's just that they were different, and this one was a more traditional horror movie with a lot of sex in it. So I was like, this, this is kind of my jam. I dig this one. Crazy stuff. Reincarnation of sex. Okay, guys, the Patreon pick here is um, from Tyler Tadeo, and this is the Friends of Eddie Coyle, a Peter Yates film. I believe Peter Yates did Bullet, if I'm not mistaken. Very cool movie 68 steve mcqueen a lot of race cars and uh this is a lot different than that film so it's a crime film we have the best one of the best actors ever robert mitchum and robert mitchum is this kind of like criminal low beat criminal drunk he's got uh he, he's waiting at waiting trial and sentencing for like this crime he committed he got caught you know transporting this shit across state lines cigarettes or something like that illegal contraband and he's waiting he's gonna probably have to do five years he's really desperate not to do it peter Peter Boyle's also in this movie as kind of like his friend, a bartender kind of deal. He knows him. It's like a small little kind of crime kind of world in this as well. And there's also you know, James Tolkien makes a little a little role in here as well. But um, Robert Mitchum is kind of dealing with guns and selling people all these guns and everything like that. And he's going through another guy who's going through a guy who's they're stealing it from the military bases. So it gets all complicated and everything and nobody trusts anybody. But this young guy ends up, you know, working with Robert Mitchum. But we have a cop in Richard Jordan great actor from Posse and a bunch of other things, died very young. And Richard Jordan starts putting the heat on Robert Mitchum's character. He says, you know, Mitchum's like, I really don't want to do this time. And you don't, you know, Mitchum can be scary. He can be, you know, a, a, just a scary kind of guy, demanding, booming voice. Even if stuff in Scrooge, he's like the owner of the company. He's very, he's very good at that. But, you know, if you look at Night of the Hunter, he's terrifying. And, uh, or, or, you know, he was in the original Cape Fear. He, he plays a heavy. Or he, he does the narration so wonderfully on the tombstone. You know, he was going to play Ike Clanton um, until he fell off a horse like the first day of shooting and hurt himself. But, you know, the idea that, you know, he is so powerful in those movies. In this movie, he is so desperate. He is so sad and genuinely seems real. So I had seen this movie on TV years ago. The, the last half of it, watched it, and, you know, I saw what happened. And I was like, this, looks, this is a very depressing-ass movie, The Friends of Eddie Coyle. He's kind of a, a low two-bit criminal, a guy in his fucking 50s. With, he's 51, he's got a young kid, and he's just desperate not to do this. And you start to like watch him do all this stuff and be slimy. But as it goes on, you know, he never does anything super bad, right? Um, he, he doesn't sell out everybody. But I don't want to spoil this movie because the, the whole thing is the idea that, you know, a lot more people are doing this shit than you expect or the people you think are, are the bad guys are in this criminal world. No one is good or bad, you know, they're all different shades of gray. I mean, they're all bad. I mean, they're criminals in this aspect, but you know what I'm saying, right? They're all different shades of, of, of criminal activity or, or loyalty. Alex Rocco is also in here. We do have a couple, you know, like ro robbery scenes and everything like that. They're pretty intense bank robbery where somebody gets completely wasted. Like the cast is great. Um, the crime seems real. The dialogue seems real. Robert Mitchum has this really good scene where he talks, I got an extra pair of knuckles. And he tells this, this guy he's dealing with about, you know, when you fuck up, you don't, you don't get to, you just take it. They put your hand in a drawer and they slam it closed. And, you know, there's times after they explain that story where he's looking at his knuckles without saying anything, you know. It's just a lot of stuff like that. Just really small little details and acting and dialogue and everything like that. Um, love the scene where they go out and, uh, you know, they're drinking and watching a hockey game with Peter Boyle. Uh, Boyle's great, too. He's in a lot of good crime films. You know, he was in Joe from 1970. 
and uh, more and more he's in Taxi Driver in 76 and of course he would be in com comedies like Young Frankenstein and Everybody Loves Raymond the TV show but he's just really good in this he's got a great look uh, Brink's Job he's also in that one so you know it's funny to think you know early in Peter Boyle's career he was in a lot of fucking crime films and, and Mitchum you know when you, I think Mitchum I, I do think of a, a, a time before this so seeing him in the 70s kind of nihilistic crime film is really cool um, Friends of Eddie Coyle is a great movie like I don't really know what else to say about it Peter Yates is a great director I've not disliked anything I've seen him direct man did Peter Yates who directed the one with um jeez Peter O'Toole was it Peter O'Toole who he makes the fucking I'm getting so old you know what I mean where he has the crazy ass boat in World War II and he refuses to give up Ah oh, man, I, I, did Peter Yates do that? I feel like he might have. But uh, yeah, so, so as far as the special features are concerned, we have high definition. Okay, we have audio commentary from 2009 featuring director Peter Yates and a booklet featuring an essay by critic Ken Jones and the ex, ex, exerted 1973 onset pro, uh, profile of actor Robert Mitchum and by journalist Grover Lewis. So great film, ex expertly well acted and crafted and just feels, feels real. You know, it doesn't ever really get to ridiculous points where you feel like this is fake. It feels like down and gritty and real and depressing as shit. You know, good stuff. All right, let's get these questions, comments, concerns. Ken Coakley. I watched the last two films in Nico Macarax's collection. Ninja Academy was entertaining. By the time we were all... We were all had enough of ninja films, but this was unique. It was certainly better than The Naked Truth. I can't believe that Brian Thompson went from Cobra to Mir and Miracle Mile to The Naked Truth. I prefer Mir Naked Truth, actually. Which, in my opinion, was the worst in the set. I discovered the Macaracas co-wrote a movie that I saw years ago that I liked. In 78, he co-wrote a film called The Greek Tycoon, starring Anthony Quinn and Jacqueline Bissett, and directed by Jay Lee Thompson. I've heard of that film. The film was uh, about Jackie Kennedy's relationship with Greek tycoon Aristotle Onastius. He was his second husband, and she became uh, Jacqueline on Osinasis. Um, her nickname from the past press was Jackie O. That movie was Nico's first attempt at a major studio release. My take on the 2015 version of Poltergeist is unbiased because I was never a big fan of the original, so I watched the remake a few years ago. Don't usually buy into conspiracy theories, but I do think there's something to the theory that the original is directed by Spielberg instead of Hooper. You know, I, I could see his fingerprints on there, but... The original has, uh, we, we actually have a Poltergeist one that's been recorded and shot and is coming out Friday. So this will actually come out afterwards, but we talk a lot about that. So the original has Spielberg's fingerprints all over the, uh, over it. The neighbors in Close Encounters, Poltergeist and E.T. seem to look interconnected. The house in 2015 version looks like a development community. The 2015 version was faster paced. I like Sam Rockwell because of Galaxy Quest the Green Mile, and I would like to see him play Merle Haggard in the biopic because he looks like Haggard. I also like Jared Harris, his father, Richard Harris, but Jared did everything on his own st uh, steam. The older sister is played by Sarah Sarbino, the sister of Brighton Sarbino from The Walking Dead. Now on to Mortuary. I like that film a lot. I was never much of a Bill Paxton fan, but I'm a huge fan of Christopher George. He was the original choice for the role in Deliverance that went to Burt Reynolds. George's agent didn't tell him about the offer, so he was doing grade B movies for the rest of his career. Before I go in, I want to mention the passing of Charles Cyphers at the age of 85. As well as frequently working with John Carpenter on several films, he was also Major League, Coming Home, Magnaforce, Tuck Turner, The Young and Field, to name a few. It's also in Death Wish, too. Got a very memorable scene in that. I met him a few times at Rock and Stock, and he was really cool. R.I.P. Sheriff Hackett. Yeah, he's a good actor. Solid actor. He's in The Fog, of course, as well. Um, 42nd Street uh, Forever. Great update, man. Here for the gratuitous armpit experience. Wasn't disappointed. There you go. There we go. Uh... <laughs> Uh, Katum 1472 that uh, that post credit sequence hey have you ever considered editing YouTube shorts for longer videos they'd get tons of views uh, I have but I don't know how to go about it don't they have to be uh, vertical um, then we have I'm just here for the thumbnail uh, okay Woo, uh, that is, that was a uh, Desi Beatnik, and then Hideki Talks. Woo, you got it right. I was enjoying watching you realize it in real time. Funnily, I've never seen Evil, Drap, Tr Evil Dead Trap 1 or 2, Hideki. I better do something about it. Yeah, they're a lot of fun. I mean, I understand. Nobody can watch it all. We miss a lot of the stuff. But then we have um, Spooky Celluloid. I don't know about anyone else, but I'm here for the armpits. First and movies, second. Good, good, good. Adam Watson, Guns. The reviews aren't bad either. User, uh, they don't have their name here. It says, Biceps got me to click. Thank you, Hudson. Uh, he timestamps the ending. Uh, stop it. Please, for God's sake, stop it. Please stop it. There's no more time. Please stop it now. Stop it now. Turn it off. Stop it. Stop it. Stop it. Stop it. Uh, Charlie Jick. Clash of the Titans remake gets a lot of hate, but I actually liked it. It's definitely not a masterpiece or better than the original, but I think it's still a lot of fun to watch. I need to get that Nico Macaracas set. My favorite Nico movie is Nightmare at Noon. That's a lot of fun. Way up, dude. Gives me a thumbs up. Thank you. Nick Mua from Belgium. 
R.I.P. Bill Paxton. He was so good in pretty much everything, and when he lent his talent to horror movies just well. While Mortuary takes his sign, Mr. Paxton's acting chops more than make up for it. Questions. Could Mortuary be remade? If so, who should be cast in Bill Paxton's role? Uh, Caleb Landry Jones plays on Hinge very well. I'm, I'm sure Mortuary can be remade, but I don't really see the point in remaking Mortuary. I mean, I, I could see Tubi remaking it. Mortuary is not... I, I, it's a fine movie. I just don't think it has like cultural impact to do it. I don't think the story's fine. I mean, the cult aspect, they would explore a little bit more. But I think the choice you made would be a good one. Caleb Landry Jones is kind of a strange character actor. He would probably do that role fine. Um, who would win in the fight of the reptiles? The croc from uh, Sopot Sands. The crocodile. Wait, what is this? The fight of the reptiles. The croc from Paul Putt Sands. The crocodile or the alligator from Louis Teague's Alligator. Place your bets. The crocodile. I Alligator's a way better movie. But that crocodile is so fucking big, it takes down whole villages. It's eating alligator crocs are also meaner and their bite is harder how would you distract a slasher killer convince him his shoelaces are untied start to sing show them your armpits um i i don't know it depends the killer depends where i am most of the time i'm gonna try to run because i'm gonna be quicker if it's a michael myers or jason Voorhees, i'm gone he ain't gonna catch me um love the poltergeist episode that movie brings back so many memories at the same time makes me feel a little sad when you think of all those who are no longer with us bye bye take care thank you angela 150 I am always happy when I see your new video. You're so cool. Thank you. MJ Worthington is a fuck in a really fun movie, uh, croc movie too, called Rogue. I've seen Rogue. It's been years though. Um, Nick Mua says, is that the movie the Wolf Creek guy made, right? And Zami Adams, Latan is absolutely unique and amazing. I agree. Travis Linscombe, haha, the armpit stinger at the end. Perfect song. Thank you guys. Let's just do the update here because it's, it's quick because it's one thing. And I, I do have these movies on Kino. And Pete Walker is the director I've neglected the most. I've seen House of Long Shadows, but uh, I've not seen any of his other horror films. So here we go here. We got the Flesh and Blood show, the horror films of Pete Walker from 88 Films. This is region locked. But what we have in here is The Comeback, Schizoid, uh, House of... Uh, Schizo, sorry, Schizo is a different movie. Um, Comeback, Schizo, Schizo, The House of Mortal Sin, Frightmare, House of Whipcorp, The Flesh and Blood Show, and Die, Screaming Marianne. It's a really cool set with a booklet as well. I definitely should just go through this whole set and watch all these Pete Walker movies. I'm kind of excited. So it's got a bunch of stuff in here. I'm super happy to get that. But yeah, let's get out of here. All right, guys. Thank you very much for watching. And as always, have a good one. Me.